Good morning. So the subject today is uh, theory of angular momentum. Okay. We already introduced the orbital angular momentum. We call it L. Remember three operators. That's that L alpha commutator with L beta, alpha and beta being Cartesian component, equal to I H bar, the epsilon antisymmetric, okay, and then L gamma. Okay? Now, in fact, there are other operators in nature which do satisfy exactly the same uh, commutation rule. One we will encounter very soon is the spin of the electron. But you can combine angular momenta of different particles and they still respect the same rule. The, you can combine orbital and spin angular momentum and they still respect the same rule. Mm -hmm. So more generally, every time you have an operator J, doesn't matter if it is orbital, spin or composition of, which respects these rules, okay, you call it an angular moment, okay? And now we will learn how to write down eigenstates for this problem common to two operators that commute, okay? The first operator is j square, okay? I told you last time that j square is the sum of the three Cartesian component square, so it's like the, so to speak, the module square, mm -hmm. although these are three operators, okay? And the other is Jz, which commutes with J square. In fact, any component mm -hmm. would commute with J square, but unfortunately, you can pick up only one, because two components would not commute, okay? So, there are only two uh, operators at most that commute, one of them is j square, the other is jz, for instance, which is a standard choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, let me, for one time, get rid of h bar, not because I don't like it, I, I like it very much, I always include it in all my calculations, because it's a good signal of mistakes in the steps, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Uh, you do some calculation, if you keep the units, you will verify at the end if your answer is consistent with the correct units, or maybe you have done some mistake. Uh, but if you put everything to one, it will be hard to see if this one is, has the wrong units. Okay? So please keep them, mm. always. But now, since we will appear in a very straightforward <coughs> way in all our algebra, I would put to be one, or better, if you don't like it to be one, just redefine every j alpha in dimensionless form, so let's call it j tilde alpha equal to j alpha, okay, divided by h bar, sorry, okay? If you define dimensionless angular momentum in this way, then by taking, by dividing everything by h bar, mm -hmm. you will notice that j tilde of alpha commutator with j tilde of beta is equal to i epsilon alpha beta gamma j tilde of gamma. Okay? The algebra is straightforward. Divide by h bar square and by h bar and h bar also here. This is j tilde, j tilde. One of this h bar goes, the other makes j tilde. Okay? Is it clear? Yeah. So this is totally equivalent, as I stressed before, to putting h bar equal to 1. Okay? So from now on, hmm, I assume that, so that we do not have this uh, object there. Hmm? Okay. So, the rest of this beginning of the lecture will be devoted to constructing states, okay, such that this is uh, an eigenstate of j square mm, and an eigenstate of jz, okay? 
Now, uh, we still don't know what are these two objects. They will depend on numbers. Hmm? Integers, in particular, or half integers, we will see at the end. Let's give names, okay? So, there will be one or, or more, two, say, uh, labels hmm? uh, here in the state. Okay. Now, M is what? Is directly the eigenvalue of JZ. Okay? So I denote whatever it is, it's a real number so far, hmm? because this is a remission. Hmm? J is related to the eigenvalue of J squared, hmm? but it's not exactly J, it's something that I call F of J, it's a function of J. We will see later on that this function is simply J times J plus 1. Okay? More about this in a while. For the time being, let me call it fj. Okay, I want to construct explicitly this object in some sense, or better yet, to determine what are the possible values of these two objects hmm, and these indices here. Okay, now, hmm, let me give you the answer before we start, so that you know where we are heading. The answer is the following. Every operator that is an angular momentum in nature of this form admits only certain conditions for this object. Essentially, there are mm, two possibilities. J is an integer. Okay? Um, which could be zero also. Okay? One, two, any integer integer, say, um, close, okay? At that point, M would be from minus J, minus J plus 1 to J, again an integer, and there are, if you count, two J plus 1 possibilities for this J, for this M, okay? Good. The other possibility is that J is equal to a half integer. Now, half integer, I mean one half, three half, five half. Okay? At that point, m again goes from minus j, minus j plus one. The formula is totally equivalent to j. So this is minus one half, one half, or minus three half, minus one half, one half, and three half. Okay? So always uh, with the um, difference of plus 1, okay, between the values, and again you have 2j plus 1 possible values. But you notice that if j is integer, this is an odd number, hmm? if j is half integer, this is an even number, okay? For instance, for j equal to 1 half, this would be 2 states. j equal to 3 half, this would be 4 states, hmm? okay? This is the answer, okay? We will prove this. And the second thing that we will prove is that fj is just j times j plus 1, in both cases. Okay? So let's prove this. Mm. To do that, it is very useful to construct two other operators that are ladder operators, very similar to the A and A darker, which we use for the harmonic oscillator. Well, remember, we introduced non-hermitian operator, combination of x and p. Hmm? Here we introduce a j plus, which is jx plus ijy, okay? So it's non-hermitian. Hmm? And similarly, I can introduce j minus, which is jx minus ijy, which obviously is the hermitian conjugate of j plus, okay? Very good. These will play the role of ladder operator. Will allow us to go back and forth in the ladder of states that we are going to create. Okay, pretty similar to what a dagger does and a does. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So the first thing that you can prove immediately is that since these two operators are combination of jx and jy, uh, evidently j square j plus should be zero. 
because I told you that J squared commutes with Jx, Jy, and Jz, and therefore commutes with J plus. And obviously, commutes also with J minus. Hmm? This is for sure true. More, slightly more complicated is the commutator of these two operators with Jz. Slightly. Let's calculate it. Jz commutator with Jx. Okay? Plus I Jy. This is about the J plus. Hmm? Actually, let me write it opposite here. J plus. Okay? And then I write it as explicitly Jz commutator with Jx plus I Jy. Okay? Let's see. We are now champions in this calculation, right? Jx and Jy, remember, this is this psychic property. So x, y, and z in this direction, right? Uh -huh. So uh, z and x gives me y. So it is i, Jy, hmm? and then I have plus i, and z and y gives me minus i jx. Hmm? If you do your calculation, it's jx plus i jy. Okay? Which is j plus. Hmm? You repeat the calculation in exactly the same way with the minus. Okay? <coughs> Here it is useful to do it like this. The first is absolutely the same. The second as an opposite sign. So this object here has a plus in the first case and a minus in the second case. Okay? And if you do just one moment consideration, you realize that this is totally equivalent to having a plus or a minus and a plus or a minus here. Okay? So, summarizing, the result of this thing is that this commutator here is equal to plus j plus if I have plus and minus j minus if, that, if I have the minus. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. It's a simple algebra. Good. Now, <clears throat> suppose that I have a, an alien state. Okay? Suppose that someone gave, gave it to me. Hmm? Some object like this. And then I ask you, what happens if I apply J plus to it, okay? So I consider now applying J plus to a state Jm that someone gave to me, okay? And I want to know if this is still an eigen state of J squared. And if so, with what eigenvalue? Hmm? And the answer is, since these two commute, okay, I can write this as j plus j squared jm, right? But I know that this is fj times that, okay? So this is equal to fj times j plus jm. Is it clear? Yeah. Hmm? So it is a negative state, because they commute, and therefore you apply j plus, it doesn't disturb at all j squared. Okay? Good. Let us do the similar exercise now for Jz. I want to know if it is a negative state of Jz, this object here. Okay? So I write it like this. Jm. Stop if you don't follow. Okay? We have to straight have the algebra absolutely clear and straight. Okay? Obviously, you can always redo it, but it's not, it's not good that you exit from the lecture today without having Perfectly blister clear algebra. Okay. Now, <clears throat> they do not commute. Hmm. But almost. Okay? I know that Jz, J plus, minus J plus Jz, which is the commutator, mm -hmm, is equal to plus J plus. Okay? I don't put the hats because otherwise too much right. Okay. So rather than having this combination, which is here, write this on the opposite thing, so write it as um, J plus plus 
j plus j z apply to j n. Okay? Is it clear? We just use the commutator to re-express these two things in terms of these two things. Hmm? Okay. Now, this is a, by definition an area state of uh, Jc with some eigenvalue m, which I don't know. Okay? So the result of this is simply m, a, a, a number. Hmm? Then I can put it in common between these two states, and what I have is m plus 1 times Jz, sorry, j plus Jm. Okay? And here again, I have the state that I had there. Okay? So if you look at this uh, expression here, you notice that here I have a state, I apply Jz, and the result is that the eigenvalue is increased by 1. Okay? Same state, the eigenvalue is more than 1. Which means that somehow I have created, if I had one state, I have created another state with a, with a value of Jz equal to m plus 1. Okay? I have increased by 1. Alright. <clears throat> um, this means essentially that uh, J plus applied to Jm has given to me what? J n plus 1. Almost. There is some constant in front because I am not infinitely sure that if this is normalized this will be normalized as written. Okay, so let's put a constant in front of normalization which in general will depend on say on J on M and possibly also on the fact that I uh, am using the plus here. Okay? Whatever. It's a constant. Fantastic. Now, <clears throat> let us do the other exercise. So we um, use the minus here. Should I use a different color? Maybe. Let's be fancy. Okay. So, suppose that I have the minus. Hmm? Now, this becomes minus. You have to be careful, however. This is minus, minus, but the result here is not only minus here, but also minus here. Hmm? Okay? Because remember that there is minus everywhere. Which means, if I rewrite the uh, new things, that this becomes a minus, and this becomes a minus. Okay? This is still m. Okay? But now you see that this m minus 1 of j minus. Okay? Mm -hmm. These are the signs have to be different. Huh? Plus minus j, plus minus, and then it has to be plus. Where? where? Uh, can I show you a word? Like, this has um, to be here and this you, has to be You are perfectly right. You are perfectly right. Uh, I did the algebra too fast. Okay. Is this first sign? Absolutely. Okay. Good. I'm happy that I provoked you in this way. Okay. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the right hand side. Okay. So it is M here that is without any sign, and the plus or minus is here. Okay. Thanks. Is it clear to everybody? Good. So the minus combination also does a very similar job. It decreases now M. In principle, there is a constant here, and the constant might be different in the two cases. Okay? So far, it's clear. So in some sense, what I have, shall I uh, draw it? Let's see if I can. What I have created so far is, so suppose that I draw here an axis with the eigenvalues m, starting from a certain value m, uh, I have increased by 1, okay, to m plus 1, with the application of j plus, and I have decreased by 1, okay, to m minus 1, with the application of j minus, okay? So I had a state here, jn, and I can create one more state above, and one more state below, 
for the eigenvalues of jz. All of them have the same j squared. Hmm? Is it clear? I can go on, right? So, given this state here, I can apply again okay, j plus, obtain m plus 2, and so forth, right? And here, I apply j minus and obtain m minus 2, and so forth. In okay? fact, would this process end hmm, or not? Or should it end forever? Hmm? If you remember, when we apply a dagger in the harmonic oscillator, the, program, the, the, the application, in fact, never ended from above. You could proceed up to plus infinity. But not so from below. If you apply A huh, and you decrease, at a certain point, you, have, you hit the, the ground. Hmm. So, we have to understand this feature, hmm? if the arrow uh, goes forever or not. Hmm? The answer is no, it cannot go forever. Hmm? Let's see what. Let us look again at this object here. Hmm? Uh, where is this? Okay. Uh, J square. I wrote it here. Uh, if you try to express Jx and Jy in terms of J plus and J minus, just invert these two equations, it's a linear equation, invert, and express J square, you will um, have also as a possible way of writing J square either this or, okay, or this. Both are good for our purposes. This will be slightly more useful in a while, but even that is good. Because somehow, mm, what I can uh, show to you immediately is that if I calculate the expectation value of j square minus jz square jm, how much is this? Let's see. How much is this? This is an eigenvalue of both. Okay? How much is it? Fj minus m squared. Fantastic. Okay? And for one side. From the other side, this is a positive operator. It's the sum of the square of Jx and the square of Jy. Okay? Therefore, this expectation value cannot be negative. Okay? Is it clear to everybody? If I calculate, for instance, j square, for instance, jx square on jm, okay? Then since jx is emission, hmm, I can bring one of them on the left hand side, and this would be jx apply to the state, say, jm. Sorry, the, 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 the notation here is a bit uh, kind of strange, but hopefully you understand it. Okay? So you apply jx to the right and jx to the left, and that's positive. Okay? And the same for jxy. So this object, which is the sum of these two, is absolutely non-negative. Which means that m square, okay, should be not greater than fj. Is it clear to everybody? If m is too large, doesn't matter the sign, huh, then this is violated. And by the way, this tells you immediately that beta fj is positive. Cannot be negative, otherwise there is no way that this can be positive, right? So it should be non-negative, and m square should be uh, less or equal to fj. Is it clear? Okay. So you cannot go on forever, because if m becomes too large, positive, or too large, negative, this constraint is violated. Okay? So it must stop somewhere, at some value m max, for sure. Right? What happens at m max? 
the state and match has the following uh, property. Okay? So you reach it, you try to apply again J plus, but what you get, how can you stop the process from proceeding? Zero. You get zero. Zero, okay, of the Hilbert space, not the vacuum, just the zero. So you apply the operator and everything goes away. Okay? Good. Let's see therefore what this particular value should be. Well, if you have gotten zero, you can apply J minus. Okay? In front. Do you agree? Okay. <clears throat> now, let's write what is the J minus J plus. Okay? J minus J plus. Okay? Is equal to let's let's calculate. Okay? It is equal to J X minus I J Y times J X plus I J Y. Okay? So this is equal to J X square. Uh, this term will give you plus J Y square. Mm -hmm. And then I have plus i j x j y minus i j y j x okay what is this the commutator of j x and j y okay and the commutator of j x and j y is i j z fantastic okay and what is this j squared minus jx squared. So this object is j squared minus jz squared minus, because i and i is a minus, jz. Beautiful, right? So I can write this object as j squared minus jz squared minus jz applied to the state j and max. Hmm? But these are eigenstates of J square, J and J Z. What is the eigenvalue? F J minus M max square minus M max. Okay. This applied to J and max should be equal to Zero. We said. Hmm? How can a state, which is a state in the Hilbert space, be equal to zero? Only if the coefficient in front is zero, right? Good. Therefore, we discover the following first um, condition, which is that indeed Fj is equal to m max squared plus m max. Let me put here m max as a factor, m max times m max plus 1. Okay? Now, let me give a name to this m max. I call it j. Okay? This object that I use here, you see, I have never, in fact, used except for fj as a pedix. Of fj. Okay? Now I call the maximum eigenvalue that I can reach with the ladder operator plus, I call it j. Hmm? And therefore, I just conclude that this is j, j plus 1. Okay? Which is one of the things that I wanted to show you. Good. There must be a minimum force, right? It cannot go on forever, even with j minus. Okay, I repeat a very, very similar exercise now. I start from, can I, can I partially erase this, but use, okay, so I now have the minimum, okay, and I know that if I apply j minus, I should get zero. Okay, since it is zero, let me just apply j plus there. Mm. Excellent. 
Now I calculate, and here I use again the colors, maybe. J plus, J minus, okay, so here there is a plus, here there is a minus, you are the checker of the sign, don't, don't, don't get, okay, so um, you see this is exactly the same, hmm? and here I have a, 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 a minus sign here, and the minus there, so if I am not done, mistake, there is only a minus sign here, which means that here there is a plus sign in the last one. Fantastic. Okay, now this object here is almost the same except that here there is a plus and here there is a minimum. Okay, and here therefore I have a minimum square but plus and minimum. Okay, did you follow? Very, very nicely. This should be zero, and therefore the same, very same fj, because after all is the same number that appears there, should be also equal to m min times m min minus one. Okay? Now, this should be also equal to the same number, which is j, j plus 1. You see it above. You can show, it's a one line of algebra, that there is only one solution out, is that this m min is equal to minus j, is the opposite of that. Okay? If it is the opposite, then this is minus j, this is minus j minus 1, the two minus cancels, and you get this. Okay? Good. So you go with m from minus j to plus j in integer steps. We are almost done. We are almost done. Okay? So, as promised, from minus j to plus j in integer steps. And here comes the question. What are the possible values of this j such that you can do an integer number of steps and go from minus j to j. Think of it. Can this be, for instance, minus pi and this pi, from minus pi to pi, proceeding with steps of 1? Would you be able to, to do it? No. Right? Because the condition is that 2j should be an integer. Okay? Any integer. Which means, so integer could be even or odd, by the way, okay? Which means that j has to be equal to n over 2, okay? So if this integer here is even, j is an integer itself. If the integer here is odd, j is half integer, okay? Let's do a couple of examples and you will see immediately what I mean, okay? So one type of solution is, for instance, going from minus one half to plus one half with one step only, okay? This is a plus one, obviously, okay? This corresponds to having j equal to one half, okay? And, in this case, n equal one, okay? The other possibility is, for instance, let's do another one, this. Start from minus one, you do one step, you go to zero, you do another step, you go to plus one. Okay? Now I have two steps. 2j is equal to n equal to. So here n is equal to 2. Okay? And obviously j is equal to 1. Hmm? So this would be j equal to 1 half, and this is j equal to 1. You can proceed. There is also the solution with three jumps from minus three half to minus one half to plus one half to plus three half. Okay, so here is j in this case, and here is the three jumps that you can make, okay, from the minimum to the maximum and vice versa. Okay? Is it clear? These are the only possibilities that 
are compatible with this commutation rule. We see, we, we didn't really use if these are special wave function of a single particle. With an abstract cat rotation in mind, some object in a Hilbert space where this leads, everything follows, okay? So it's not a single particle. It can be any system with angular momentum J. It's a very, very deep result, okay? Good. Clear so far? There's only one thing that I left behind, is this strange normalization here, which I told you uh, in principle is not, uh, not one. Hmm? Let's try to calculate. Essentially, the algebra that we have on the board is perfectly uh, adequate to calculate this constant. Okay? Let's try. <clears throat> Let me do it for the plus. Okay? So, I take J plus, JM, and I take the scalar product with itself. Okay? So, I have to take the adjoint of everything. So, J minus times JM. Okay? This, according to what I wrote above, should be equal to the modulus square of this JC plus JM times J n plus 1 with J n plus 1. But I pretend that this is equal to 1. It's still normalized. Has this was normalized. Okay? So this, in the end, gives me the coefficient that I want. Hmm? Now, let us look. Luckily enough, I did not erase the important ingredient. J minus J plus is J square minus J Z square minus J Z. Okay? So I write it here. J square minus J Z square minus J Z. Hmm? So can you calculate now how much is this number? Okay? Equal to, let's see, J square is J J plus 1. Minus m square minus n. So minus n times n plus 1 is clear. Okay? So the modulus square of the coefficient is this number. Okay? Which means that j plus jn, I can take it to be an arbitrary phase in front, an arbitrary modulus 1 complex number, which I put to be plus 1 times the square root of j, j plus 1, minus m, m plus 1. Okay? That's the solution. And you see, the solution is nice. Not only correctly normalize things, but if I try to apply it to the maximum m, okay, so suppose that I put here m equal to m max, which I remind you is j, hmm? then I find that this coefficient is exactly zero, okay? So if I apply this to the m equal to j, the result is zero times something, so zero. Hmm? So it correctly puts to uh, zero everything and stops the process. Is it clear? Hmm? So the normalization is very effective in doing that as well. And then I have the other calculation, which is the one with the minus. Here I have a minus. Again, I pretend to be normalized. And here I have the opposite configuration, which is the minus and the plus. Okay? And I, then I use the algebra that I made. And here I have a plus. And here, if you do the calculation, it's just the minus here. Okay? Because it's minus and minus is a plus. Okay? So the result is that for the minus, the, fine, the uh, constant has a minus here. Okay? And if you check what happens when n is equal to minus j, if you try to decrease it further, the coefficient is zero. Okay? So the coefficients are nice uh, for normalizing the function and also stop, stopping the process. Okay? On the contrary, if you remember, the coefficient for the harmonic oscillator had the square root of n plus 1. Okay? 
So uh, if, uh, if take n, I do this, and I get n plus 1. And there is no way you can stop something if there is a factor n plus 1 in front. You can go for, forever. Hmm? On the contrary, remember, a n was square root of n times n minus 1. Okay? And you see, it's very simple to stop the process from continuing. n equals 0. Uh, from n equals 0, apply a again, square root of 0 is 0. Okay? So you cannot go below the bottom of the graph. Okay? So you see, the commutation rules of a and a dagger, I remind you that a and a dagger had a commutator root which was 1. Profoundly different from the commutator of angular momentum, for instance, of j plus and j minus. Hmm? Uh, this implies this different behavior. So a ladder that goes on forever for the harmonic oscillator and a finite ladder for the uh, angular momentum hmm? with a given number of terms that is integer, even or odd. Is it clear? Good. Um, okay. Now, having <coughs> established this, now we do as an application constructing the spherical harmonics. Okay, the spherical harmonics are again written in the in the in the, in the books. Okay, usually, especially in electromagnetism. But now we will try to calculate them. Precisely with this type of uh, uh, tricks, okay, which we use to deduce the general properties. So, but too much stuff, so let me just erase most of it, and I will try to reinstall the appropriate things whenever I will need them. Hmm? Okay. Maybe I'll just leave this. All right, so let's let's uh, uh, look at uh, the standard angular momentum. So from now on, I would write L square, okay? Here, sorry, L square, okay? And rather than J, I could write L. So this is L, L plus one, okay? And here I would write Lz, and here again L and L. Okay? Now, this is again written in abstract head notation, but these are functions now of the coordinates. Hmm? In particular, of what coordinates? If you remember, L squared and Lz are just function of theta and phi and derivative of theta and phi, and not of the radial distance. Okay? So these, in fact, will be functions of the two angles, hmm? which I have written here in a, a kind of abstract cat notation. Very good. <clears throat> now, you know that Lz had a simple form. Lz was equal to minus i, um, the derivative with respect to phi, if h bar is put to 1. That's the only thing surviving. Okay? So let me find for you straightforwardly what are the possible values of L. Hmm? So what I want is some Lz and some function hmm, of theta and phi, which is equal to hmm, M. That's the, what is written here in more practical terms. Function, you apply Lz, but Lz is what? So it's minus i, the derivative of the function, okay? Should be equal to m times the derivative of the function. Hmm? What do you expect this function to be? Huh? You should have a plane wave factor, so this object here should be some function of theta times e to the i m 
phi. Is it clear? Then again, I write phi and two possible variants, but it's always the same phi. Sorry. Okay. In general, this, this uh, constant here will depend on, as far as we know, L and M. Okay? Good. Let's write it like this. Now, this is a function in space. It is going to tell me what is the amplitude, okay, uh, for finding the particle at a given angle phi. Hmm? But as you know, phi uh, is determined up to 2 pi. I can add 2 pi to my phi angle and it's the same point in space. Okay? So, this object here should be the same if I consider this angle to be, say, pi over 3 or 2 pi plus pi over 3. should be the same value of the function, right? Otherwise, it would be a mess. Is it clear? It's not enough to have the module square. Don't think of, ah, but I can put a face. No, no, no. It's the same point in space. So I better have the same value of the function. Independently, if I call this number pi over 3 or 2 pi plus pi over 3. Hmm? And you immediately realize that in order for this to be true, it must be that e to the i m phi plus 2 pi should be <coughs> equal to e to the i m phi. Hmm? What are the possible values of m that make this equality true? Integers. Huh? Integers. Integers. So m should belong to integer. Okay? But you remember that m, we're going from minus j, or minus l in this case, to plus l in steps of 1. So if they have to be integer, better l is integer. Okay? So l must be integer. Okay? So the orbital angular momentum of a particle has to be integer. Could be zero. They are called the S states of the atom. Okay? Could be one. They're called the P states. Could be two. They are called the D states. Okay? I'm using terminology that is common in atomic physics to denote the possible wave function uh, of the atom. Hmm? They are increasingly more complicated. Hmm? There are even the F states. Certain heavy atoms do have F orbitals that are filled. Okay? And so on and so forth. But this must be an image. So it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, in principle so forth. These are called the S, this is the P, this is the D, this is the F. These are the most common. Okay? Good. Let's construct explicitly those functions, okay? It's not enough that we have understood that they are integers. Or let's do it, okay? To do it, we have to understand what's in here, hmm? because this only gave us the phi part of the wave function. Okay. Now, hmm, what do you think will be the best state to construct? It's always a general rule. Start from the top or the bottom, whatever, up to you. I always start from the top, okay? Try to get the expression for the top state and then get all the other by applying J minus, okay? Or L minus in this case, okay? So let's do, follow the strategy. I try to write an equation for the maximum state. Ah, let's, let's do it, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's do it for general L for a while. Okay. <coughs> so, I take uh, the maximum object, which is the wave function associated to LL. Okay? Okay? And I apply N plus to it. Okay? What should I obtain? Zero. Because that's the top, both the top state in the moon. Okay, but on the other hand, I know that this object is equal to the p l l. This coefficient here, this 
object, which is a function of theta, times e to the i l, okay, phi. Okay? Good. Now we have to know what l plus is. L plus, go and look at the, I'll tell you the equation number. The equation is uh, 5.9. Okay, I'll write it here. In terms of Lx and Ly, you construct L plus, which is the following. I e to the I phi minus I the derivative with respect to theta uh, plus the cosine theta divided by the sine theta, strictly the cotangent you will find on the north, and the derivative with respect to phi. That's L plus. Okay? Good. So let's use it here. Why right? e to the i phi? Hmm? Oh, it's trivial. I mean, if you go and look at the expression for Lx okay, okay, okay. and Ly, you will see that there are sine theta, sine phi and cos phi. You superimpose them and you find e to the i phi. Okay? You have to do it. If you don't do it, uh, but once you write it, you say yes. Okay? Good. Okay, so I substitute. So that's equal to i, e to the i phi, hmm? and then I have minus i, the derivative with respect to theta, of, of what? Of p l l of theta, times e to the i l phi, and that's a function, uh, you apply only to this term, hmm? and then I have a plus, the cos theta over the sine theta, Again, if I have P and L of theta, hmm? and then I have the derivative that I have to apply to this object here, which is I L e to the I L C. Is it clear? I applied the derivative already. While well, here, I just indicated there. Okay, now you see that the L and the L here can be put in common and you write this as I e to the I L plus 1 times phi. And then I have minus I, the derivative with respect to theta of P and L of theta, plus I L uh, cosine theta divided by sine theta P L L of theta. Is it clear? Just copy everything very nicely. Now the I and the I can be put out, okay? Here, so I square, so minus one really. Mm. And this object should be zero. Ah, how can it be zero? Well, mm. um, it's a simple differential equation. Well, simple. Not difficult, say. Okay? The differential equation that you have to satisfy is, let me write it here, that the derivative with respect to theta of P L, L of theta should be equal to L, the cos theta divided by sine theta, P L, L of theta. That's the condition that is written there. Hmm? Then you might say, I have never seen this. It's almost true. But remember, when you have an exponential, when you have a power in general, hmm? I have, say, x to the power n, and I take a derivative, I bring down n, okay, and I get one power less. So x to the n divided by x. Now, this suggests that somehow here I have brought down a, hmm? but the right thing to do is to consider x to be sine theta. Okay? So let me just argue with you that if you consider this to be some constant times the sine theta to the power l, that's perfect. Why? Take the derivative. You get L 
So this object becomes L, CL, you get the sine theta to the power L minus 1, but remember, it's a derivative with respect to theta, so I have to have a derivative with respect of the sine, right? Which is the cosine. And you see, that's exactly what you have there. There is a cosine, and there is one less sign, which is this denominator here, and there is a factor of L. Is it clear? Okay, good. So the solution is this. And you can even calculate, but that's a boring calculation. In principle, what is the coefficient? You go and look in Mathematica or Google somewhere, okay? The coefficient can be written down. <coughs> Uh, I'll just note it for future reference, maybe CL is equal to um, uh, 1 over uh, 2L, L factorial, and then there is a square root of 2L plus 1 uh, times 2L factorial divided by 4 pi. And for reasons that have to do with the uh, sign of the things, here you put a factor, okay, which is minus for the odd L and plus for the plus. I think angular momentum is a hugely developed a subject with lots of objects like the 3J symbols by Wigner, the Klebs Corbin coefficient, the uh, Rakhanam. There are books on these things, and you have to be respectful of many conventions, okay? And one of the conventions is science that you put on the things to make somehow the resulting algebra nicer, okay? So the standard thing is to put here a factor also of science. Okay? Is it clear? Okay, so I have constructed this object here which is some coefficient times the sine of theta to the power L times e to the i L C. Okay? Sorry, it's too small. I know. Okay. Here. C L sine theta to the power L e to the i L C. Let's pause for a second. Is this clear to everybody? Okay? So this is the top function in the list. Hmm? What should I do to construct all of them? Apply J minus, L minus, sorry, repeatedly. Okay? And without forgetting, sorry, I call C too many things, without forgetting the famous square root factors in front. Okay? I have to implement them, otherwise the normalization comes wrong. Okay? Once I normalize the top one, if I remember those square roots, all of them will be correctly normalized. Okay. Now, it's boring because I have a function and what I have to apply, an operator, which is this object, I write it for you. It is i e to the minus i phi, and then here I have i, not plus, d in d theta, and then I have plus the cos theta divided by the sine theta, and then I have the derivative. Okay? So this is the operator that I have to apply repeatedly to go down in the list. Okay? Very boring. Absolutely very boring because these are functions and I have to apply derivative. I don't want to do it, obviously, except for a couple of cases. The first case is the simplest one, okay? So, so what is the smallest value of L that you can think of? Cannot be negative. The smallest non-negative. Zero. Zero. L, zero, okay? So L should also be zero, from minus zero to zero. Excellent. What is this function here? So the y, no, let me write it here, the y, 0, 0, theta, and phi, okay? It's a coefficient of normalization, c0, times sine theta to the power 0, which is 1, 
times i to the l phi, where l is 0, which is 1. Okay? So it's a constant. That's it. So the function doesn't depend on theta and phi. Nice. L equals 0 are invariant by rotation. What is the constant? Put L equals 0, you will understand this constant is 1 over square root of 4 pi. Okay? In such a way that if you take the square of it and you integrate over the whole solid angle, which is 4 pi, you get 1. Is it clear? So the normalization condition for the spherical harmonics are always the integral from 0 to pi in d theta of sine theta integral from 0 to 2 pi in d phi of y l n theta and phi modulus square should be equal to 1. Okay? This is the condition that you impose. Hmm? So in this case it's 1 over square root of 4 pi. So we did the S state. Fantastic. Let's do one more case, which is the P. Hmm? So L is equal to 1 now. Okay. <coughs> L equal to 1. First of all, how many states should I expect? 3, right? So M would go from my 1, 0, and minus 1. Okay? So M equal 1, M equal 0, M equal to minus 1. These are the three states. Let's try the top state. So Y, 1, 1, theta, and phi equal to some normalization constant, C1, times sine theta to the power 1. Okay? Good. Sine theta e to the i 1 times phi e to the i phi that's it that's the function for 1 1 hmm? and if you want this number hmm, put l equal 1 and you would discover that the number is and the number is minus square root of 3 okay over or no, over 8 pi. Okay. And then the boring part, apply this two times. Okay? So apply this piece and then again and remember about the square root factors there. Uh, I I mean it's too late to do it. You allow me not to do the algebra? Please do it yourself, okay? Uh, the result is uh, the following <coughs> the y 1 0 function mm, of theta and phi is equal to minus square root of 2 times the same constant c1 times the cosine of theta okay notice obviously by applying l minus I erase this plus here, okay, and there is no dependence on phi because, after all, remember here m is phi, and, and the uh, f angular function with m equals zero should not depend on phi, and the sine is transformed into cosine by by derivative, okay, and this object here you can even write it explicitly. The coefficient in front is equal to square root of three over four pi. Okay? Uh, I, I including the square root factor? Including the square root factor. Okay? Because you see there is a minus that cancels this minus, and the square root that cancels partially the 8 pi and becomes 4 pi. No, I mean when we are lowering the state. Oh, this is already including, so these are the correctly normalized states which require here the square root of j, j plus 1 minus. <coughs> M, M plus or minus 1. Okay? Remember that there is a difference. Absolutely, yes. I, in other words, in other words, if I <coughs> take this, okay, let me be explicit, and I do L minus of Y11, one one, okay, that is not going to be directly the Y10, but rather the square root of 1 times 1 plus 1 
minus 1 times 1 minus 1, okay, times y, 1, 0, okay? And this goes to 0, so there is a square root of 2, which is exactly what you find. Ah, yeah, 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 yes. Okay? Good. The sign comes from the derivatives. Good. So you do the calculation and you get this, and you do a final calculation, which means taking this y10 function and uh, getting the y minus 1 function. Obviously, this time you have to do this minus, minus nothing, minus 0 times. Okay, all? okay? So again, the square root of 2. If you do it, you find that y, y, 1 minus 1 of theta m phi is equal to plus square root of 3 over a pi. The sine theta again comes, and because of this minus object, becomes e to the mi minus phi. Okay? So here is plus, here is minus, here is sine, here is sine. The coefficient is almost the same except for exchange of sine. Hmm? And these are the three spherical harmonics for L equal to 1. Hmm? How tired are you? Okay. Is this a general property where y of j, j and y of j minus j differ only by signs and phases? Uh, yes, yes. You can prove mm. the following. You can prove that <coughs> y l minus m okay is equal to of theta m phi is equal to minus one to the m times y of l m theta m phi star okay so the minus m is the star of the m apart from the minus one to the m so for instance here you see it they have a different sign. Uh, M was 1. If it was 2, they would be exactly the same. And then 1 would be... Okay? Good. So this is a, a general rule. Um, and there are other uh, rules of parity. Uh, so uh, another general thing is the following. If I invert a point into minus the point, Okay? And I ask you what is the function at that inverted point. So remember, how do I invert the point? Theta becomes pi minus theta. Or theta minus pi. Okay? And phi get the plus phi. So phi plus pi. Sorry. Okay? That, let's draw it. Suppose that this point was theta, hmm? and I want the point oh, yeah. there. Hmm? Here I have phi, and I have to add a pi to get to the other side. Okay? And if this was theta, hmm? the theta here is. <coughs> the theta there is. Uh, I think I think I'm wrong in that. <coughs> uh, it's pi minus theta. Yeah. Right? Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think in the north there is a mistake. So this is the function at the inverse point. And then you can prove that they are equal to minus one to the L, the Y, L, M, at theta, in phi. In other words, if I invert the point, I could get the same value if L is even, for instance here, obviously totally insensitive, and the same for the D states, so L equal 2, but for L equal 1, if I invert the point and you do the algebra, you would notice that there is a minus sign. Okay? So the functions are in fact odd. Hmm? 
So L equal 1 is odd, L equal 2 is even, L equal 3 is odd again, and so on and so forth. Okay? <coughs> now, let me just conclude this boring part. Hmm? First of all, exercise, try to repeat the same procedure for L equal 2. It requires a little bit of algebra, but it's absolutely essential that you see it once and you do it yourself. Okay? So construct L equal um, 2, hmm? the states. Second, you often see in the books not these three functions, but combination of them, and they are even drawn. They are drawn in this following way. If this is x, y, and z, you often see the, the pz orbital is drawing like this, okay? And the px orbital is drawing like that, and py is similarly drawn like this. What does this drawing mean? Okay, let me just explain to you two minutes the meaning of those things. There is a first thing that you should observe from this expression here. Which, there are some combinations that you can form. Okay? Let me uh, just erase for a while. So, the first useful combination is 1 over square root of 2 y 1 minus 1 minus y 1 1. In other words, take this and, s and, and subtract this, or if you want, add this. Okay? So you see that the minus compensates with this minus, and the result is square root of 3 over 4 pi, the sine theta, uh, now, e to the minus i phi minus this object here actually gives you the cosine phi only. Okay? Now you take 1 over square root of 2 and you take y1 one minus 1 plus y11 one one, and you put an i in front, okay? So that when you do the algebra of these two things with the i, you end up with a sine phi. Square root of 3 over 4 pi sine theta sine phi. And finally, nothing to be done. Y10 is equal to the square root of 3 over 4 pi times the cosine theta. Okay. Let's see if we recognize in these three objects here something familiar. Okay? Remember. If I have theta, and this is phi. Okay? The z component is cos theta. Okay? That's the reason why this orbital is called the PZ orbital. So the PZ orbital has M equals 0, remember? Hmm? Is invariant under rotation by phi. That's the reason why, and we'll see more about this later, is drawing like this, okay? Like a, a small tube, okay? <laughs> because it's, uh, the function doesn't vary if you uh, move uh, with phi around. Hmm? Uh, the sine theta cos phi is the x component of the uh, vector r. So in this sense, this is often called the px Cartesian orbital, and this is called the py Cartesian orbital. Okay? Uh, now, what these drawings mean? After all, I have to draw a function of space hmm, and I want the value of the function. So if you start thinking, how should I draw the function, you realize that you have just too many things huh, to draw normal functions. Okay? Uh, you might say, okay, let me just draw it, because after all these are 
points in space and I want to, uh, to attach a value to a point in space. So I would need definitely too much um, access to put the full information. But I can uh, ask you the following. Do a line, okay? The slide mm. somehow gives you a certain direction mm, and draw uh, so you have a certain theta and a certain phi associated to this line. Mm. Uh, draw a value of uh, a point on this line proportional to the value of the function. Okay? In other words, if I have here a certain theta and phi, I draw here a certain segment which is proportional to the cos theta. Okay? Obviously, you realize that it doesn't depend on how I put the, the, the stick, right? The, on phi. It's the same stick length. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if I draw it here, the length is zero. And if I put it here, it increases because the cos increases. And the maximum stick is when theta is equal to zero. Okay? So if I draw segments of length proportional to the cos theta, eh, I get exactly this strange lobe that you see in the books. Okay? Totally symmetric in phi and bigger at theta equals zero and zero, in fact, there. So maybe the drawing is not very nice. You should try to do it with some uh, plotting tool. Mm. But in principle, or, or draw with a few theta mm. and try to join the things. And you will realize that. And by the way, for theta equal to positive between 0 and pi over 2, this function is positive. So you can associate here a plus sign. While if theta is negative, mm, sorry, it's bigger than pi over 2, the cos is negative, and therefore you, generally speaking, associate a minus sign to the lower log. Okay? Have you seen these drawings in the books? Hmm? So this is the PZ orbital. Uh, a strange uh, ba 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 balloon-like things, totally symmetric around the z-axis, with plus above and minus above. The stick is proportional to cos theta. Hmm? The same thing, although it's much uh, harder to realize, is essentially this orbital. This orbital is the rotation of this on the x-axis. Okay? Now, it's obviously not independent of phi, because the axis is nice, the z-axis is nice to phi. The x-axis is not nice to phi somehow, because phi, as you, as you move phi, uh, x uh, changes, right? So, but it's the same shape. It's simply uh, inclined in the x-axis. Okay, that's more difficult to visualize, I admit. Hmm? And the same for y. Okay, so these are the Cartesian components, which are uh, uh, composition of uh, 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 spherical harmonics. Now you might say, wh why do you want to do that? Well, for atoms in vacuum, these, this, you will see, these energy states are kind of degenerate. And therefore you can just uh, add them as you wish with arbitrary coefficient. But when the atoms start to be in crystals, okay, then there are effects that are called crystal field effects. Okay? The atoms, for instance, see each other. And if I have two carbons uh, uh, in a certain direction, call it x, then having the two px like this or having the two PZ like this is a different thing because the overlap that this uh, functions feel is very different. Okay, so typically it matters. Okay, for overlap and bonds of electrons in molecules and in crystals to uh, properly select the correct combination that somehow give a better bonding. Mm? And this is quantum chemistry somehow the level of zero or uh, um, very simple solid state theory. Okay. I will not spend time on that, but think of the importance of this actual um, Cartesian combination when you have atoms in molecules and in crystals. Okay. Uh, questions?
Now, I know that you are right and you are tired, and therefore I would uh, not start today, but I will just tell you just five minutes uh, uh, about the um, experiment that in 1923 revealed that there is something else in nature that is not integer angular momentum. Okay? Uh, I'll tell you just the experiment in a second and then, mm. and then we stop. And next time we continue introducing the new actor in the game, which is the spin. Okay. <laughs> the experiment was done by two persons called Stern and Gerlach in 1923. So, strictly speaking, before Schrodinger wrote his function, okay? It was an experiment like this. <coughs> you have some oven, okay, some furnace, uh, which produces atoms. Hmm? They are in fact silver atoms, okay? But for what I'm going to say, you could mentally think that they were hydrogen atoms. The reason why they use silver and not hydrogen is because hydrogen doesn't want to doesn't like to stay alone. They usually form molecules. Okay? Well, if you take some piece of silver and you boil it sufficiently, then you evaporate silver atoms no? everywhere with large velocities. They jump like crazy. Huh? And you take a hole, hmm? and here comes a beam of atoms that fly away. They fly in every direction, but there is only this hole. So if you put just a nice uh, screen here, you can just get a collimated beam. Okay? This is very, very typical. You create in the lab beam of things by uh, essentially um, uh, having very hot uh, metals, okay? And they spit away um, particles like this. So here you have silver atoms coming out in a small uh, thing which you can make, you can control by this hole here. Okay. Now, they make it pass through a magnet. More properly, the magnet has some, uh, say, north pole and some south pole, but they are not just two pieces, two flat things. They are made like this. This is the North Pole, and this is the South Pole, okay? Uh, what's the reason for, and this is the axis, say, okay, where the um, silver enter. Why do they make the, um, uh, the North Pole pointed there? It's because, as you know, in electromagnetism, Corners tend to create larger fields. This is two also for electric field. Okay, so the magnetic field, rather than being, say, a, a, a uniform field, it's actually more intense here than here. Okay, so if this is the z direction, the bz magnetic field is larger here than here. Okay, good. Now, there is a screen here, okay? And filling a magnetic field, the silver atoms, they wanted to see if the silver atoms had a magnetic moment. That's the, the goal. Does silver atom have a magnetic moment? You might think, uh, why not? After all, <coughs> the magnetic moment in electromagnetism is related to the angular momentum of a charged particle, right? If you remember, if I have a charged particle rotating in space, this will generate a little small current and therefore a little magnetic moment. And there is a relationship, in fact, between the two, which is the following. Minus the charge, say, if I have an electron, divided by twice mc, the magnetic moment. Okay? Good. So, I have some magnetic moments, presumably, here. Mm -hmm. Remember, AG is, in fact, a 4s orbital, 
with a single electron. Now S is L equals zero. We will see all these things later on, okay? When studying atomic levels. But, and also I am here anticipating things. There is an electron, okay, in the 4s orbital. Mm? Good. L is zero. But even if it is not zero, L might be an, an orbital angular momentum, which in principle could have one or three or, um, uh, well, or two or, or, or four, whatever, integer, okay? Integer value. Mm? Good. So what they see is that rather than having here a blob of atoms, they find two very near spots. So the atoms are deflected, but they form two spots. Let's start to understand why they are deflected first. Now, if I have a magnetic field which depends on the position, let me call it B, R, R is the position of the uh, atom, okay? Then you know immediately that there is a potential energy that the center of mass of the atom feels. Because if you remember, presumably from your electromagnetism, that in the presence of a magnetic field that varies in space, the magnetic moment, okay, couples to the magnetic field with the potential energy, which is that. You remember this. You have seen. Good. Um, so if I ask you, given this potential, what is the force that the uh, atom feels in the Cartesian direction J? Hmm? Okay, so J could be uh, Z or X or Y. Hmm? That is equal to, at position R, is equal to the mu, is minus the gradient of that. So mu dotted into the derivative of B with respect to Rj. Is it clear? Remember that Fj is equal to minus the derivative with respect to Rj of the potential energy. Okay? So there it is. <coughs> now, to a large approximation, the magnetic field is along Z, which means that it is the Z component of this thing that counts most. Okay? And so you realize that if you make the magnetic field different along different directions, uh, the different points here, there is in fact a gradient, okay? And the gradient is such that uh, depending on the component of the magnetic moment along the z direction, you will feel a force, okay? <laughs> but you would expect that the magnetic moment would be in every direction and so the classical expectation is a blob, a spot there. On the contrary, they find two things. Hmm? So, in modern view of the things, here is the spin up that end up in this point, and here is the spin down that end up in that point. Obviously, they still didn't know okay, about what exactly a spin is. It was discovered theoretically by Dirac. Okay? in 1930. He wrote a relativistic equation okay, for which the spin was magically appearing in the appropriate limit. Okay? But nevertheless, it appears that the magnetic moment of those silver atoms that, after all, should not, now with our modern mind, should not have an angular momentum, because here we have the last orbital huh, which is in an L equals zero uh, state. And if you remember, L equals zero is zero orbital angular momentum. So, in principle, if there was no spin, there should be just one little spot in the middle. But there is not one spot. There is not three spots, not five spots. Okay? It means that there must be some angular momentum whose values are half integers. Okay, in such a way that the total number of possible uh, values of the LZ or SZ, whatever, are even. Okay, remember the minus one half plus one half story. Okay, so next um, time we continue the story, but the crucial thing is that nature revealed to Stern and Gerlach 
then there are also angular momenta that are half integer. Okay? So we will continue next time. <coughs> Thank you.